You are listening to Arcane Carolinas, an exploration of the Carolinas' folklore, legends, myths, and modern weird. Each episode, we examine the historical context of our topic and aim to preserve some of the stories that help make this part of the world such a fascinating place. Just wanted to start this episode off by letting you know that this is an episode containing two segments that are unrelated to each other. So you're going to hear the first part, which is about spontaneous human combustion. Who doesn't love spontaneous human combustion? And then you're going to hear a little like musical zinger. And then there's going to be a second segment. So I just wanted to bring that up so that you would know when it sounds like the episode is winding down, the episode is not over. We just recorded a little conversation between us about an unrelated topic a few days ago and wanted to toss it into this episode just to share our enthusiasm for it. That segment is the Boglins segment. We say this in the Boglins segment, but I want to reemphasize we're not getting paid anything. We're not getting anything from them to talk about them. Charlie read about them and thought it was really neat. And I think that is awesome. And I'm so glad that we got to chat about it because it sounds really cool. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoy this episode. (laughs) So we have been trying to get my notes up for the last 33 minutes and we finally have because as michael just so succinctly put it cloud computing solves all our problems doesn't it i love the cloud the cloud loves me the cloud loves me so much that sometimes it takes the things that are precious to me and it keeps them very safe (laughs) from even me well we're recording to the cloud so this episode is brought to you by the cloud (laughs) In a lot of ways, it's like the thing that I often do myself, which is say, oh, I need to remember where this thing is because I'm going to need it six months down the road. So I'll put it someplace special. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Very, very secure. This is a topic that I really, really like, and it was picked by our Patreon backers. Yeah. So I'm pretty happy about that. Our story today is not the one that they actually voted on. (laughs) <laughs> it's in the same genre, but as I was investigating the one that they voted on, that took some twists and turns that I didn't expect and will wind up being a separate episode with a completely different flavor, a little more supernatural. This is more sciency, for lack of a better term. But I love that. I love it when we pick a topic or when Patreon backers pick a topic for us, rather. And it turns out to be something where there's like real meat on the bone, you know? Yeah. I was like, we're going to talk about these spontaneous combustions. And then those spontaneous combustions weren't what anyone thinks of when you think of spontaneous combustions. I find the topic of spontaneous combustion fascinating. I have read very little about it, know very little about it, but concept itself at sort of the elevator pitch level is terrifying and fascinating. And so when you said this was going to be the topic and that you were going to handle it, I was like, this is amazing. I'm going to get to just sit back and listen. It is weird and scary because you can blow up. (laughs) Okay. Hmm. I have uh, been interested in this, not like intensely, but I wrote a paper in ninth grade biology on spontaneous human combustion. Did you? I did. I was in honors biology in Mr. McDivitt's class. And Mr. McDivitt said that we could pick our own topic for our like spring paper. And I was a weird young man that said, I want to write about spontaneous human combustion. Wow. And he said, if you can find enough legitimate sources to write on it, you can do that. But you can't just talk to me about the X-Files in a paper for three pages. <laughs> <laughs> or you know whatever the page count was for ninth grade bio. Do you remember what grade you got? I got an A. He loved it. Awesome. Yeah, because it's pretty well documented, actually, the phenomena. Going back several hundred years, at least, you know, there's earlier primitive art of people like belching fire and stuff, which we have no way to interpret what that means. But as far as like the era of modern and semi-modern medicine, there are reputable examiners that have concluded that people just blew up. Wow. So we'll get into that, including one in the 70s in France, but that's not what we're talking about. Today, we're talking about Greenville, South Carolina, Okay, which is located in Greenville (laughs) County, South Carolina. I'm chuckling because I, for complicated reasons, more or less lived in Greenville for a year at one point. I lived in Greenville five days a week for work. And that was a long time ago, and Greenville was an interesting place, is what I will say. Well, it is the most populous county in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. It was originally Cherokee territory. Settlers arrived, and in general, it was like really peaceful and like everything was cool until the American Revolution, 
when there was a split between British loyalists and revolutionaries. So that sort of brought conflict and division to the area. Uh, There were battles and fights and whatnot. After the revolution, things settled down, cotton mills popped up, a rail line was eventually built. Uh, During the Civil War, even, the town was quiet until 1865, Union troops came through looking for a fleeing Jefferson Davis. Plot twist, he wasn't there. If you haven't seen that episode, uh, sorry for the spoiler. (laughs) Post-war, it continued to thrive as a textile town and by 1915 was known as the Textile Center of the South. Oh, interesting. Yeah. There was an army training camp there in World War I, an army air base in World War II. It's currently home to a number of colleges, a GE manufacturing facility, Michelin, like the tire people. They have their North American HQ there. If you've ever driven on 85, you see it. I think it's 85. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But if you're like driving to Atlanta, for instance. Yeah, huge facility. Lockheed Martin is there. 3M is there. They have a Boston Red Sox affiliate minor league baseball team. Okay. It's kind of a happening place. Like when you list all these things, you're like, well, they got a lot going on there. This is why it's the most populous county in South Carolina because they have a lot of jobs. They have a lot of stuff. Yeah. I've only ever driven past on my way to Atlanta. So I don't know a whole lot about it, but in terms of local attractions or businesses, the South Carolina Comic Con is held there. So that's something I would be interested in. And they have a bunch of breweries. They have wineries. So I'd, I'd be into that too. Also, somebody blew up there. Okay. When I was living there off and on, there was an arena football league team there. If you remember arena football. Oh, yeah. Yep. I don't know if arena football in general still exists. I'm pretty sure it does in some capacity. Okay. And the civic center where they played, I guess, is what I would call it. The arena where they played, I guess, Mm -hmm. since it is arena football, was next to a massive graveyard, which at the time was the dominant feature of downtown Greenville. (laughs) Yeah. Come for our football, stay for the graveyard, or vice yeah. versa, whatever. <laughs> Come for the graveyard, stay for the football. So our story was reported on March 2nd, 1953 in the Greenville News newspaper with roughly these details. At around 11.15 a.m. on a Sunday morning, March 1st, 1953, passerby saw smoke coming from the windows of a car parked on the shoulder of Bypass Highway 291. The car's windows were blackened by the smoke, hiding the interior. The passerby stopped and ran to the car to investigate and try to help, but as they approached, it pulled off and drove about 400 yards down the highway, where it skidded 10 feet to a stop, teetered on the edge of the road, and then rolled 270 feet into a ravine, flipping over twice on the way down. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Police and firemen arrived on the scene. The cabin was still filled with smoke and smoldering. So they smashed out the the windows and began putting water in there. They couldn't see the blaze, but they could see smoldering. And as the smoke cleared, they found what was left of Wayman Wood. So I am going to do a screen share now, and I'm going to show you what they would have seen. This is Wayman Woods, Wayman Price Woods grave. Oh, so it was very easy to verify stuff on this story yeah. because of how recent it was and how widely reported it was. That is his car. Wow. Oh, gosh. So you can see that it's kind of banged up like physically from rolling down the hill. You can see that the fire and the, and the fire damage is pretty localized to the driver's seat. And here is the actual newspaper clipping. Wow. And we will put all of this on the Facebook page. Oh, that's just horrifying. So to say that he was burned badly is an understatement. (laughs) Uh, The fire. Sorry, I shouldn't. (laughs) In your defense, I played that for comedic effect. (laughs) Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. I just didn't want any listeners to think that I don't feel a little bad about that. (laughs) <laughs> now, nah, so he, he was all burnt up and the fire did appear to have been focused in the driver's seat where he had been seated. The upholstery above his seat and the driver's door had been burned and charred. Plastic fittings around the window and on the door handle had, had burned off. Uh, the windshield glass was reported to have developed a bubbled effect from the heat. But in comparison, the front passenger seat was barely burned and the back seats were completely undamaged. The scene attracted a number of gawkers, as you can imagine. Sadly, including young children. So the remains were hastily removed from the scene as Mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. At the time of the report in the newspaper, the coroner had not yet had a chance to do any sort of examination. Police tentatively listed cause of death as possible suicide. It was generally stated by investigating officers that knew Mr. Wood that he had, quote, been in ill health. 
I'm raising my eyebrows as loudly as I possibly can. There was a second short follow-up on March 3rd that the coroner had had a chance to look at the bits and said this was a suicide by fire. And I am not really sure about that. That sounds like somebody in search of an easy answer. Like that sounds like something it's awfully tidy to write in on a death certificate and then stop thinking about it. Swamp gas. <laughs> right, exactly. It's the swamp gas of death methods. So. Suicide by fire is exceptionally rare and it's complicated and people don't do that without, you know, screaming and stuff. Also, so I did some digging through genealogical stuff. Again, this was super easy because of how recent it was. Uh, he had a wife, he had young children, and I will admit that that is not always enough to stop people from hurting themselves. Oh, um, sure. Th- this was 1953 though. And like you just mentioned, there are easier ways to off yourself if that's what you're doing. Yeah. So let's say the wife and kids aren't enough to make him stick around. Let's say ease of use or ease of method isn't enough. Let's even say he was broke. Like, let's say they're like, I'm playing devil's advocate. Like, let's really sure. like lay all the things out there that sometimes contribute to these terrible circumstances where people harm themselves. This is 1953. The model of the car was a 1951 Nash. And that would have been very easy to sell if he was in financial straits because Nash Automotive was kind of a big deal. They weren't one of the big three, but they innovated tons of stuff that we take for granted. Like it wasn't a schlub car. It had seatbelts, it had unibody design. Um, Nash pioneered air conditioning in vehicles. Like they were not slouches in the auto industry. So the guy has a family. He's got a nice car, which in 1953 is a huge status symbol. I don't know. I just don't think burning himself alive would be the way to go if he was not long for this world. Yeah. I mean, like there are lots of possible extenuating circumstances. It's hard for me to read somebody's intention from so few details, but the method alone, that presents a real stumbling block to credibility for me. So there was a magazine called Fate. It was a periodical that covered paranormal and strange topics. Yeah. It was read by a guy named Curtis Fuller, who had a column or a section, a part, a segment, whatever you want to call it, in in (laughs) Fate called I See By The Papers. And it included strange news sent to him by readers from all around the country. And in the July 1953 issue, Fuller summed up the main point saying, passerby saw smoke, tried to help, car drove away into a ravine, fire confined to the driver's seat, official guess was suicide. But he also included details that were not in the newspaper where we don't have any record of, you know, we can't reach out to Curtis Fuller and say, who did you talk to? But he had additional sources. Friends had been talking with Wood only an hour before, reported he had seemed cheerful. A reporter on the scene stated that he didn't smell any gasoline fumes or anything that Mm -hmm. would smell like an accelerant. Yeah. And these new details are clearly meant to counter the suicide theory and remove the like, well, maybe he doused himself in gas. Like it's clearly yeah. meant to, to remove that. Uh, and a shorter, different version of the story appeared in 1964. Basically, this has become a perennial spontaneous human combustion story where magazines would pick it up and like run it over and over and over. It was written by someone named Alan Eckert. And the article was titled The Baffling Burning Death, and it appeared in True Magazine, a magazine dedicated to supposedly true tales of adventure and strange occurrences. Mm -hmm. And he boiled the entire thing down to three sentences. On March 1st, 1953, Wayman Wood, 50, of Greenville, South Carolina, was found crisped black in the front seat of his closed car, parked on the side of Bypass 291. There was little left of him or the front seat. The heat made the windshield bubble and sag, yet the half tank of gas in the car was unaffected. So that was interesting. Hmm. Keep in mind that's, you know, a decade removed. Yeah that he wrote but this that's just to illustrate the story in particular repeats it's been on television shows it's been in books and magazines and it's interesting that that second shorter one just like omits the part that the car was parked and then began driving yeah very very strange story and all list all kinds of stuff. There was the Greenville News. There was another one in the Greenville News. True Magazine. Mysterious Fires and Lights. And my favorite, Mysteries of the Unexplained, published in 1982 by the Reader's Digest Association. You remember those uh, books? Nice. 
I, I remember the infomercials for those books. Totally. Those on the Time Life books, I like was just desperate for. Yeah, they had like the cool pyramid on the front with the light. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, like, there's so much about this that just doesn't add up as a suicide. Can we get on the side of the road? Then starting to drive after he started to do it. And in my head, when you were telling that, I was like, well, maybe he had at that point expired and his foot falls off the gas pedal or off the brake and the car rolls under its own idle power mm-hmm. except then skids to a halt that's somebody hitting a brake you know like none of it adds up and makes sense i think he exploded because i will go into the science of this now but i i think it can happen under the right circumstances we know that spontaneous combustion happens with inanimate objects like mulch piles or oily rags or improperly stored hay right mm-hmm. so all of these things can spontaneously combust people are different because we have have so much water in us yeah but it like i said it's been reported a lot and the descriptions generally have consistencies where the core of the person is burnt up but not the things around them Mm -hmm. limbs are generally left behind like little leg stumps or arm stumps or whatever oh i don't want to make this too gruesome but you can find these pictures very easily they're all over the internet because people have been photographing this since there were cameras and people blew up yeah surprising number of documented cases one of the more recent ones i could find was in 1977 that woman in france the, the coroner instead of saying suicide by fire said spontaneous combustion i have no idea she blew up well good on that coroner for doing their job <laughs> this person caught fire i have no idea how or why <laughs> i have examined the remains and that's what i'm writing on the death certificate yeah so these are reputable people there are common themes that are not universal Like there's a lot of stories where, oh, this person was a raging alcoholic and regularly consumed an excess of alcohol that would kill somebody else. So their blood alcohol must have been high. Sometimes they're overweight and like, oh, it's their fat tissue that ignited and like basically served as like a wick, like a candle. Hmm. Sometimes they're in poor health. That's just the very general like, oh, they're in poor health. Some theories involve excess methane. Excess methane. Deadly farts. <laughs> so you are so filled with farts that you just Gosh. blow up. Wow. That speaks to some real problems. <laughs> Better out than in, I always say. <laughs> Gosh. Gosh almighty. Ooh. I mean, I think we've all been there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just I thought that was funny. It's really funny. It's so also people, very distressing to imagine experiencing. So people have been trying to figure this out for, for a long time. Mm-hmm. And there's a scientific journal that's been in publication since 1937 called The Microscope. Biologists, chemists subscribe to it. And in volume 60, issue 2, 2012, there's a researcher named Brian Ford who really went to the mat on this topic and okay. researched experimented, applied proper methods, and he came up with a decent theory on why people sometimes blow up. Okay, I'm fascinated to hear this theory. So there's a a plausible model is, is what we'll say. Sure. It's based on natural metabolic things that happen in the mm-hmm. body. And he reviewed tons of cases going back in, in some instances, hundreds of years up to the present. And one factor that he said had been overlooked was when the metabolisms of cells are forced to change new biochemical pathways emerge. This is a direct quote from him. When reviewing the victims of SHC, spontaneous human combustion, I discern a single factor that they might all have in common. Some, but not all were alcoholics. Some, but not all were overweight. Some, but not all were old or enfeebled. Some, but not all smoked cigarettes, but they all seem to have been unwell. In many conditions, including alcoholism, blood glycogen levels become depleted. Cells can no longer rely on conventional energy resources and fat molecules are used instead as an energy source. You might know this as keto, oh, the fad diet where you remove yeah. carbohydrates and you remove sugars yeah. and you use fat as an energy source. Yeah. I, I know two people that have done this diet and apparently it, you are very unwell <laughs> at the start yeah, of it. Uh, a friend of mine who does keto describes how they periodically experience something called keto flu. Mm-hmm. And apparently that's a term that gets used by people who do keto and are real devotees of that lifestyle. And according to this person, it involves their electrolytes getting out of balance or something thing and and basically they start to feel bad and in their case they have to drink a whole bunch of pickle juice basically and then they say that they feel better 
Right as rain. Yeah. So the way it works is triglycerol lipids split to provide fatty acid chains and a glycerol molecule. And the fatty acids are used as an alternative source of energy through a process known as beta oxidation that gives rise to acetyl coenzyme A or acetyl COA. And that drives the Krebs cycle, which is the energy cycle in the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Thank you, Mr. McDivitt, ninth grade biology. <laughs> <laughs> and it's ketosis. That's what it's called. Yeah. The thing is, a settled COA in the liver is translated into, I'm going to botch this one, acetoacetate, which then goes through an organic process. This is all organic chemistry that's completely plausible and explainable mm -hmm. into acetone. And okay. if you talk to someone that does keto, one of the common side effects is that your breath smells like nail polish remover. I was going to say acetone is nail polish remover and that's highly flammable. Crazy flammable. Have you ever played with it and fire or am no. I like outing myself as like a mischievous <laughs> kid right now? Okay. So no, I have not, but my <laughs> chief use of it was in high school. I was in marching band and the shoes that we had were these vinyl durable, yep. exceptionally durable <laughs> shoes. And we had to clean them using nail polish remover and we always got told like do not smoke cigarettes while you're cleaning your band shoes the flashpoint is very very low so my next door neighbor growing up had an older sister and um we played with firecrackers and bottle rockets and bb guns and like sure. all the stuff you're, all the stuff you're not supposed to blowing things up and i remember he got caught stealing his sister's nail polish remover his mom caught him leaving out the front door with it <laughs> we, were, <laughs> we were basically like trying to make rocket fuel we're like well, what if we create like a booster for this bottle rocket and like strap a gi joe to it and yeah <laughs> that was the goal was always to make the gi joe fly and it never happened yeah I, 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 another did. round of experiences with nail polish remover was definitely the rocky horror picture show phase of college where you know mm -hmm. you have to remind everybody do not smoke cigarettes while you're removing your nail polish etc so unwell tired dieting rigorously or exhausted the general thing is that acetone levels can increase. It doesn't necessarily have to be that you're trying to do the keto diet. Your body can enter the state of ketosis when it needs to. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why I hate biology and I get so freaked out because there's so much going on that could go sideways or wrong or <laughs> like I just, ugh, I get, I get freaked out by it. There's just too much going on. I would imagine that this same process happens basically anytime anybody, for instance, goes running and they like burn through the readily available carbs in their system and start burning fat as part of just like aerobic exercise. Right. So imagine you are, in the words of the investigators in the case of, of Mr. Wood, generally unwell. Maybe he doesn't eat right. You know, yeah. maybe, maybe he doesn't sleep enough. Maybe he drinks too much. I don't know. I'm not yeah. saying that, that he did that because he does have living family. I'm not trying to imply that, but you know, yeah. I don't know what his practices were in his daily life. So this researcher then created control dummies. He created a, a series of dummies and built out a series of model rooms, all, you know, consistent. And he tried lots of different things where one would have simulated tissue soaked with acetone. One would have simulated tissue soaked with alcohol. One would have simulated tissue with nothing. And he did all this stuff. And what was really interesting is that the simulated tissue with acetone, he still, something still had to act as a flashpoint, right? Sure. You, but the body burned like a candle when you combined the natural water content with the heightened acetone and fat tissue. And it, it's like the fat helped helped it serve as a wick. So he basically verified a bunch of different theories in one. Mm -hmm. His conclusions were, you know, this is plausible. He didn't solve spontaneous human combustion, but this is a plausible model. And a lot of the occurrences that are reported involve someone smoking or sitting near a fireplace. Again, I'm, I'm not going to post the really gruesome pictures on our social media accounts. Ugh. But if you want to find them, it's very, very easy using Google. And you'll see that a lot of these happen next to fireplaces or like at the stove mm -hmm. or something like that. And, you know, maybe if you do keto, it's a good time to stop smoking. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> But like, you know, there are reasons why somebody would accidentally enter a state of heightened ketosis or unintentionally, I should say. Mm -hmm. like, let's say that I mean, it's 1953. What if this guy had celiac disease? There probably wasn't exactly a lot of understanding of sensitivities or allergies to gluten at the time. Mm -hmm. But I bet that there were a lot of people back then who did eventually figure out things like, oh, if I eat breads, then I feel bad. So I'm going to stop eating those. And they wind up cutting back on carbs without that being the intent. The intent just being like, when I eat normal food, I feel bad so i'm trying to change up what i eat 
to see if I'll feel better. And then there they go. They're eventually on a keto diet before it's called a keto diet. Right. So that is the story of Mr. Wayman Wood from South Carolina that blew up in his car and a plausible explanation as to what may have happened. It's so easy. I I understand that it's all circumstantial, but, and it's conjecture even, but it's so easy to put together a chain of totally innocent and unintentional factors that lead to somebody's diet changes for whatever reason, you know, for many reasons, possibly. And they enter sustained extended ketosis. Their body is pumping out acetone. Their tissues get soaked. They're probably soaking their adipose tissue with acetone. So they've got fat dipped in in nail polish remover. They sit next to the fire. They're outgassing acetone because you said that one of the common side effects of keto is that people start smelling like nail polish remover. Yep. They're outgassing a flammable gas. They light a cigarette, poof, up to go. Horrifying. I really think this topic is interesting, like I said, and it's scary because you're like, oh, that could happen. That is, I nearly used a word that we don't use on the show because my emotional reaction to it was sincere enough to prompt some cussing. That is (laughs) wild. Yeah. Be wary of what gases you're emitting, but don't worry too much about your methane. That's probably not. You got I mean, you got to have a lot yeah. going on. There are over the counter remedies for that also. <laughs> you know, if that is a problem, like talk to a doctor, try <laughs> one of those remedies. There are a lot of options. Eat differently, but apparently don't switch to keto without consulting a doctor. Part of what's wild about this to me is that ketosis is sort of, if I understand it correctly, is sort of the core mechanism in a lot of diets like the South Beach diet, the Atkins diet, all the sort of like low carb variants are mm-hmm. ultimately about rejiggering the body's chemistry to burn fat instead of sugars. Yeah. And if you do it to an extreme or for too long, you could potentially be a danger to yourself. Also, just like different people's bodies work in different ways. Like anybody who's ever gone to a doctor and gotten a cholesterol test has gotten told at some point, well, here's the value in your test this time. It'll be different next time. It was different last time. Like there is a range of what is normal for what quote unquote normal. There is a range of, of what is expected for the average person. And there are people whose bodies naturally operate outside of those ranges, you know, Mm -hmm. and any individual's body operates within some range based on, you know, what they've done for the last few days, et cetera. And so this is all something where it's, you don't have to get that far outside of what might be expected on the part of biology and biochemistry to get there. Oh, okay. Spontaneous human combustion just became even scarier. Sorry, I'm just like, I'm having to process all of that out loud. That's a lot. See, I I have had these notes on deck for several weeks now uh, since they voted on it. So I'm really wanting to bring this up in conversation and like holding back <laughs> because it, it it's, I don't know, I like this one. And we will get back to the 1930s spontaneous combustions that I teased on the Patreon account. It's just, like I said, that took a twist and a turn that I did not see coming that I think relates to, it ties into something else. Okay. So we'll, I, I'm really curious now whether it's like Carrie is you know somebody's keto advisor or <laughs> or is it more like archangels said you on keto oh. smite <laughs> smite yeah. somebody push the smite button <laughs> <laughs> did you leave the cover off the smite button what did you do <laughs> exactly <laughs> whoops gosh <laughs> that is that is wild So that's all I had for today. We are reducing our content this month, uh, but we really still appreciate you hanging out with us. Oh yeah, totally. Everybody's busy right now. (laughs) Really looking forward to some stuff we have cooking in which I took a trip and found some cursed, some new cursed dirt and have some tests to share. I'm very interested to hear about the new cursed dirt. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Hello, this is your co-host and semi-pro chuckle hustler, Charlie Mewshaw. <laughs> semi-pro chuckle hustler. Wow, I had to say that very carefully. I don't even know if I needed <laughs> to say that very carefully, but I felt the pressure to do so. This is Michael Williams. I am your semi-pro. Uh, you're, oh, know. you're 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 one too. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I we guess were told chuckle hustler. <laughs> we were told that we giggle too much, yeah. and. You know what I say to that? I don't giggle. I chortle. <laughs> I giggle. I go, <laughs> if you're not laughing with your friends while you're talking to them, what are you doing? Oh my God, right? Jeez.
Anyway, and then I thought about it some more and was like, you know what? No, people like us. People wear our shirts. That makes me a semi-pro. It's not my full-time job, but you know what? (laughs) Don't tell me not to laugh. I'll laugh when I want. Yeah, we did have somebody accuse us of having too much fun making this. And it's like, well, you know, we invite people to come to the table and like listen to us (laughs) shoot the breeze about this stuff and have a good time and enjoy something that we all enjoy. And if somebody doesn't enjoy that, well, there are other podcasts out there. I'm sure there's somebody out there who wants a television show and takes themselves very seriously. See, I mean, yes, that is the alternative. We could take ourselves very seriously. But in my head, as you were saying that, I just pictured like the Grumpy podcast where it's just two people just miserable. Like not like not talking to each other. Like, how are you today? I'm fine. Really like late stage. Laver- they would be like a late stage Laverne and Shirley, but about the yeah. paranormal. <laughs> right. <laughs> so speaking of things we all enjoy. Yeah. This is a, this is a mini episode. It, it takes place in the modern times. It is a very current topic and we do try to promote current topics and local businesses, but there is a throwback to the eighties. So first we'll start with where it is. Wake County, North Carolina. We've already talked about Wake County. I'm not going to run through the history, Mm -hmm. but I will take us back to the 1980s where it was the era of critters and gremlins and ghoulies and little monsters in movies. Oh, yeah. Like that was, I mean, that's basically a whole subgenre of science fiction from that era. Like not even a figurative statement. Like there's, I had a shelf in the local video store where I grew up. During that time period, three people, Tim Clark, Maureen Trotto, and Larry Mass, created a line of cute, mischievous, but not murderous creatures called Boglins. Okay, so not goblins, but Boglins. Yes, Boglins. It it just occurred to me that that's where the, you know, that the name involves that reversal. Yeah, it's clever. I like that a lot. And Tim Clark, one of the creators, big into world building and storytelling and lore. He is a professional toy designer and puppeteer. Uh, He was involved with Fraggle Rock and the creation of Uncle Traveling Matt. Uh, I think he did some stuff in the Dark Crystal. And so the Boglins were not tied to a television show. They were not tied to a video game. They were not tied to a movie. These were purely creative toys. They were puppets. They were these little, here, let me do a screen share and and show you a Boglin. So there were these really cool puppets with super squishy and stretchy moldable material where you could make them express different faces. You could move, you see that the eyes are like really detailed. You could move the eyes. Oh, okay. So you can use your fingers in there to like manipulate the face. Yeah. Super cool toy. Very well loved. Somewhat of a underappreciated brand, in my opinion, that has had a long and storied life in the secondary market of collectible toys. I will say it's it's interesting. We've talked about retro toys a lot on here. Somebody actually figured out and commented on our Instagram account uh, about a line of toys that I produced in the 2000s. No way. Um, That's so fabulous. Yeah. The Saucer Knots. This is... This is becoming a bit of a toy podcast, but this is modern North Carolina. <laughs> there are worse things to be a podcast about. Let's not let's not beat ourselves up over that. So there's this rich lore around the Boglins, great storytelling, totally fantastical, creative-based play device that that fell off the map until this year when Triaction Toys from Wake County, North Carolina, launched a Kickstarter that just ended that brought in a quarter of a million dollars in pre orders Yeah. That's not bad. Boglins are back. And I am really excited about this North Carolina business. I am really excited about what they're bringing to market. And to be totally clear for listeners, we're not tied to them in any way. No, no. Yeah, sorry. Getting Uh, anything out of talking about them. It's just something that's unexpected in the Carolinas and really cool. Yeah. And I think that people that are fans of our podcast will be into the aesthetic of the Boglin. Totally. If you want Um, a little monster, that's you want to know about this. What's the opposite of, so we're not paid endorsement. I actually paid them. They... (laughs) (laughs) so you i'm assuming you backed it and then you wanted to talk about it yeah i was just really excited like i want to make little videos for our king carolinas with boglins i wonder what the term for that is i guess it's a volunteer enthusiast as opposed to a a paid endorsement yeah i don't know this is whatever it is yeah we're not paid by them they they don't we don't work for them there's no business relationship i just really know how to find these people (laughs) i i just think they're really neat 
You can find the full release schedule for the Boglins at their Kickstarter page, which is accessible through theboglins.com. Make sure you put a the on there, theboglins.com. Also, check out tryactiontoys.com, the company that is doing the manufacturing, I think, distribution for them. Do really cool European-inspired like plush toys. European-inspired plush toys? European design. Think Ikea. Like very, oh. neat, very like okay. neat and orderly and yeah. like clean aesthetic. Very, very cool stuff. Oh, neat. Um, okay. And they actually had a coupon code, Holly Holidays for 15% off going. And again, we are not endorsed by them, but you know, if you want to buy toys, there's, yeah. there's, there's a coupon code. You want to save uh, a buck. There's, you know, everybody likes to save a buck. So where to find the Boglins to support this North Carolina business? You'll be able to buy them online. This is all according to their websites. You'll be able to buy them online starting in January. You can like pre-order them. They will have limited availability at like comic book shops. So support your local comic shop, buy a Boglin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And again, there's no game. There's no cartoon. This is going to drive creativity, content creation. I think we're going to see a lot of Boglins on I'm not on TikTok, but <laughs> I'd imagine you'll see <laughs> Boglins doing things they shouldn't on TikTok and, mm. you know, being silly and making jokes and, you know, stuff like that. I don't know. I'm just really excited. It's a North Carolina business. They're weird little puppets. And I think they're fantastic. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think it's really worth, I, I'm really glad you pointed out that these are not like tied to another property. This isn't an ancillary or like aftermarket kind of thing where, you know, somebody is trying to make a movie to sell toys or trying to sell toys to get people to go see a movie or whatever. I mean, that kind of stuff is really cool. I have some really neat, like, movie tie-in statuettes and things like that that I sure. really love. You know, my husband and I have a bunch of, like, Funko Pops and that kind of thing. But I think it's also worth noting that this is something that somebody created as an original. I started to say first order, but that's not a term <laughs> you can use anymore. So, you know, it's sort of an original, like totally distinct kind of thing. It's unique. Yeah. It comes from an era where little kind of cute murderous monsters were a thing, but they weren't that. Yeah. They were different. They were for kids, like decidedly for children. Um, Mayhem, not murder. <laughs> Yes, mayhem, not okay. murder. Anyway, check out theboglins.com. Check out tryactiontoys.com in Wake County, North Carolina. Uh, we love seeing people in the Carolinas achieve success, and it would appear that they are on the verge of doing that with this project, and we're really happy. Yeah, thanks for listening. Two. You've been listening to Arcane Carolinas. Thanks for joining us. If you liked it, give us a rating. Leave a comment. If you didn't like it, send us an email and tell us why. If you're not wrong, we'll try to fix it. And if you're interested in award-winning speculative fiction, including science fiction, urban fantasy, and horror, find me, Michael G. Williams, at www.michaelgwilliamsbooks.com and check out Falstaff Books at falstaffbooks.com. If you'd like to pick up some Arcane Carolinas merch, look at behind-the-scenes info, pictures videos, stuff like that, all the things that get cut, check out arcanecarolinas.com where you can get access to our Patreon, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, all that in one place, including the merch store. Buy a shirt. Clothe your body. Drape your body in our wares. Be our living billboards. <laughs>